Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Love you all, that's awesome, thank you, thank you. Uh, I wanna give a huge shout out uh, to each and every one of you. You all in your communities are fighting for a better province and a better country, and I wanna acknowledge the work that you do every day for your members, for your community. Thank you so much for that. You deserve the applause, for sure. Uh, I also want to acknowledge your incredible president, uh, J.P. Hornick has really breathed new life into the leadership. She is, uh, they've brought in this energy and this passion and um, you can hear it in the room. You're all stoked about J.P. and the team, so really want to acknowledge you, president. And we just heard from Marit. Uh, Marit was the president of the NDP when I became leader, so I always call her my president. Uh, I also want to call her my premier of Ontario in the future, uh, Marit. She gave us an incredible vision. A big round of applause for Marit Stiles. I know you've already acknowledged the, the land that we're on today, and I just want to take a moment. Every time I think about the opportunity to speak in front of people in a, in a new territory, I, I think about when we acknowledge the territories, what that really means. It means an opportunity for us to acknowledge the injustice that the first people of this land have faced and continue to face, but it's also an opportunity for us to collectively commit to fighting for justice for the first people of this land. And I want us to make that commitment every time we acknowledge the territories that we're on. Yeah. I also want to talk to you about the vision that we have as New Democrats and the vision that I have as leader. JP mentioned one of the things that my mom taught me is this idea that we're all one. And it's something that I, I grew up with, really believing that we're all one and that we're all connected. And we see people around us hurting, we're also hurting. But if we lift the people around us, if we lift each other up, we all rise together. And so our vision is truly one that we are better off as a people, we are better off as a province, we are better off as a country when we take care of each other. That's truly what makes us progressives. That's what makes me a new Democrat. And so our vision for Ontario, our vision for Canada is one where people have good jobs that can pay the bills. You can fill your fridge with stocked with good, healthy food. You don't have to worry about finding a home that's in your budget because you can find something that you can build a family, raise a family in. That you've got the ability to get healthcare when and where you need it, no matter what you earn. And then healthcare covers you from head to toe. It doesn't exclude things like your teeth or medication or your eye care or mental health that we truly have universal public health care for all. That's what we believe in. That's our vision. We believe, and I believe fundamentally, that we can take care of our environment, we can protect our environment, and build an economy where there's good jobs and shared prosperity for all. We believe that we can respect indigenous communities. We can work in partnership with indigenous communities to build that shared prosperity. And that we need to implement all of the TRC calls to action. And we need to make sure that we're implementing the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls calls for justice. These are fundamental things we need to do. That's the vision of what we want to build. But as Mart was mentioning, and as you all know so well, it's sadly not what we're up against right now. Right now, in our country and in this province, people are worried about buying groceries. You hear stories of people going into the grocery store and picking up items that they used to be able to afford, looking at the price of it and saying, you know what, I can't afford this, and putting it back. People with decent jobs are feeling the squeeze of the cost of living crisis. Inflation means that everything has gotten more expensive. People are worried if they can keep their homes. As interest rates have risen so quickly, people are wondering if they can actually make their mortgage payments. Things are getting really tough out there. And while we're facing all these struggles, it seems to be there's a constant theme. Anytime the times are tough, there's winners and losers. And we see that every single time times are difficult, it is workers that have to bear the burden. In the pandemic, Workers are asked to sacrifice. Right now in the cost of living crisis, it's workers that are feeling the burden. But you know who's not feeling the burden? You know who's not feeling the pressure? Wealthy CEOs, those at the very top, they're making more money than ever before and that is wrong. We need to end that. It shouldn't be that in every, str in every struggle, in every crisis, it's working people that bear the burden. 
we should finally say that it's those at the very top that should be contributing their fair share and we should be lifting up workers. Now, given these struggles that we're going through, given these tough times, what are the responses we see from political leaders? We see Trudeau, who is pretty satisfied with things just being the way they are. He is under his leadership over the past number of years. Things have gotten worse. The cost of housing has gone up. It's not gotten easier to pay the bills. Things have become more and more difficult. And I wonder why often. Why is it that someone who's got the power to make such a difference in people's lives, that could solve the problems they're going through, chooses not to? And you look at the examples, the recent vacation example. The lifestyle of the Prime Minister is one where he does not understand the struggles of everyday Canadians. He doesn't understand what people are going through, and so he doesn't understand the urgency of solving the housing crisis. He doesn't get how serious it is to defend our public health care system. Even though he has the power to take on premiers like Doug Ford, he doesn't use his power to do that. And then we look at the other alternatives. We look at the other alternatives. We look at Polyev, and I want to be real with you. You know, there's a lot of reasons you can fight with, you can fight Polyev, but let me tell you straight up what he wants to do. And he's not hidden this. He wants to cut EI. He wants to cut CPP. He wants to cut childcare. He is okay and wants to encourage more for-profit delivery of healthcare. He wants to erode all the things that we need. He's not going to make things better for workers. He is not on the side of working people. And we have evidence of it. What do conservatives do when they get into power? Well, let's look at Doug Ford. What has he done? He's attacked workers. He has attacked our healthcare system. He has brought in more profit, more for-profit care. He has made things worse. We know conservatives, when they have power, they help out their wealthy friends and they hurt workers. That's what they do. But I got to say, Doug Ford didn't know what he's up against. He thought he could fight with workers, and then workers fought back. <laughs> workers showed when we come together, when workers come together, workers have incredible power. I see the, the signs up everywhere. We organize, we fight, and then we win. That's what we do. When, when, when workers organize, when we fight, we win. And we showed that. And that's the power of workers and the power of unions and why we need to strengthen unions. Because as Mart was saying, as you all know, the best way to tackle inequality, the best way to strengthen the power of workers is to make it easier to join a union, to strengthen the power of unions, to strengthen the power of workers. So I, I told you that, you know, the. The Liberals, they're not the solution to the, the struggles that Canadians are going through. Justin Trudeau is certainly not the answer. Pierre Polyev is going to just make things worse. So what's the answer? I'd like to encourage you all to consider New Democrats as the <laughs> But I want to tell you a couple of reasons why. One of the reasons why is New Democrats understand the struggles. You know, when I was, when I was in my 20s, I was 20 years old, and my kid brother was in a tough situation at home, things weren't going well, and I had a tough decision that I had to make with my mom. I said, things aren't really healthy at home. My dad was struggling with an addiction, and so I made a tough choice with my mom to say my brother should come live with me. And now, as a new parent, I get what that's like for my mom to have to admit that she wasn't able to take care of my brother to keep him safe. So we had a 15-year-old kid brother and a 20-year-old university student living together, which was pretty interesting. We'll tell you some stories about that later. But uh, I had to take care of my kid brother, and I was, uh, anyone had to cook food for a teenager before? <laughs> boy, oh boy, I was, on the, I was on the phone with my mom, asking him recipes, and I'd cook a meal for my brother. I wasn't very good, I'll be honest with you, at cooking back then. I'm really good now, my wife will tell you. I'm the cook of the family. But at the time, I was struggling, so I'd have my mom walk me through the recipe, cook a meal for my brother, he'd eat it, and then he'd say, what's for dinner? And I would sit there thinking, that, that was dinner, I thought. And I called my mom again, say, Mom, I need another recipe. Your son is just not ever getting full. Uh, but I remember, <laughs> I remember this call I got from my mom when uh, she was sending some support because she knew me and my brother needed some help, so she was sending some money to us. I got a call from my mom that my dad wasn't doing well and that he had lost his ability to work and that she couldn't send any more money. 
And as the eldest, any, any eldest siblings out there, you know, when your mom is worried, you don't want her to get, you don't want her to have that fear in her voice. So I was at super confident. I said, I got this mom, don't worry. I'll take care of Grutten, my brother, you know, your son, he, he'll be okay. You left him with me, he's gonna be okay. Uh, we'll take care of it. And I could hear her voice was relaxed after hearing the confidence. I got off the phone, then I panicked. because so I was like, how, how am I gonna take care of this kid? So I went out and got three jobs. I worked retail jobs, I worked minimum wage jobs, and I worked really hard. And no matter how hard I worked, I could barely keep food on the table. And if you've ever had to take care of a loved one and you're worried, not about yourself going hungry, because I wasn't worried about me. I probably could have used to lose a couple pounds, but I was worried about my kid brother going to high school. I could never imagine him going hungry. And the feeling you get in the pit of your stomach thinking that if you don't work hard enough, if you don't buy enough groceries, it's your, it's your dependent, someone that depends on you that's going to go hungry. It's a scary feeling. And I can tell you, I am not a self-made person. At that time, when I was working hard and struggling, we made it through not just because of my hard work, but because of the generosity of friends, of family, and strangers. There was a, one of my brother's friends when he went to school, their mom kind of figured out things were going on, that uh, two young guys living together, there was probably some struggles. So she would send food back with my brother. And when I mean food, she'd send us buckets of pierogies. <laughs> and like... These pierogies, they would fill up our fridge. Like they would fill up our freezer and I got real creative with how to cook pierogies. So my brother would then ask me what's for dinner and I'd say, oh, you know what's for dinner. <laughs> We're eating pierogies tonight, brother. Uh, but to this day, I've not been able to thank that mom for her generosity. Those pierogies meant the difference between us eating well some weeks and, and not eating well some weeks. And I know that's what Canadians are going through now and a lot worse. People are going to food banks, people are struggling with the cost of living. And we get that. And for us, it's not good enough to just wait until another election to try to make things better for people. We used our power now in this minority government to deliver real changes for people. We use our power to deliver help to people, to give people a break. <clears throat> So in this minority government, we delivered a number of concrete things. We doubled the GST rebate, which puts money back into the pockets of people to be able to pay their groceries. We're proud of that. We got this government to commit to a couple of things that they've never, been, never wanted to do in the past before. Uh, something that we need here in Ontario. I'm hoping that we can set the precedent at the federal level. But we know when workers make that difficult decision to go on strike, one of the things that undermines that important decision, which is so hard to do, is when replacement workers are brought in. That undermines the power of workers. So for the first time ever, we've got a commitment that by the end of this year, because of what we force this government to do, we're gonna bring in anti-scab legislation in this government, in this country, for the first time ever. We're gonna make that happen. The consultation has already started and we're well on the way to make this happen. And once we make it happen here or in, at the federal level, we need to make it here in Ontario and every other province that doesn't have those laws. We need to protect workers with anti-scab legislation. We also, as a part of our agreement, we force this government with our power in this minority government to finally bring in and enact fully 10 paid sick days at the federal level. That is now the law of the land in Canada at the federal level. So we got it done. And because we fully and truly believe that we are all better off when we take care of each other and when we lift each other up, uh, we brought in the first massive expansion of our healthcare system in a generation. Millions of people will be able to get their teeth fixed by the end of this year with a dental care expansion for the first time in our country's history. Yeah. We're proud to say that by the end of this year, seniors, kids 18 and under, and people living with disabilities will be able to go into a dentist's office or a hygienist's office and their bill will be paid for by a national federal program for free. Dental care will be free for these Canadians. We're not going to stop there though, there's a lot more we need to do. So by the end of this year, we also are going to force this government, it's in writing, because we know one of, our, uh, one of my MPs described working with the Liberals like wrestling an oil slicked eel. <laughs> pretty accurate, pretty accurate. We got to fight, even though we've got things in writing, we still got to fight them to make it happen. But by the end of this year, in our agreement, we're going to force this government to table and pass a Canada Pharmacare Act, which is the legal framework for Pharmacare to move forward. Yeah. 
For the first time ever, we have forced this government to tie investments in clean technology to good wages. Because we know it's not good enough to just give money away. We need to tie that money with strings attached to real guarantees for workers. So for the first time ever, a company can only get the full benefit of this incentive if they can guarantee prevailing wages, good wages for workers, which is the way we've got to do things. We've got to force these companies to deliver for workers. And one of the things that you'll not hear either Pierre Polyev or Justin Trudeau do, we're willing to call out the greedy CEOs that are exploiting people. We recently, if you remember, we, we took on Galen Weston in Parliament. You know, this is one of the wealthiest people in Canada who's making more money than he's ever made before. And I asked him directly, well, how much profit is enough? You know what his answer was? Nothing. He couldn't answer because there's no limit to profit for wealthy, greedy CEOs. And that's why governments have to step up and fight back against their greed. We know that inflation right now, a large portion of it is because of the greed of CEOs using it as a cover to increase their profits. And we're saying enough is enough. No more. We just announced an initiative where we want to tax the excess pay of CEOs. And what we're going to do is very much inspired by what Bernie Sanders introduced in the States. The idea is if your pay is far more than the average pay of a worker, then you're going to have to pay more tax. And if you want to, that's right. And the example we gave is Galen Weston right now, his CEO salary is 431 times the median income of a worker at his company. 431 times. So we're saying, well, if you're going to have that much money to pay your CEO, then you're going to have to pay more for society. You have to contribute more towards health care. You have to contribute more to the public good. And if you want to pay less tax, increase the wages of your workers. I want to wrap up with a couple of uh, last comments. Uh, one is our brothers and sisters are right now uh, on the picket lines. PSAC is fighting. Full solidarity with them. I was on the picket line in Ottawa with them and they're in good spirits, uh, they're fighting hard and I, want, I wanted them to know this and I want everyone to know this. When workers go out on the picket line, they're obviously fighting for their members, they're fighting for their wages, but they're fighting for all workers. Because the message they're sending is, workers deserve to have wages that keep up with inflation. That's true. We deserve that here in Ontario, workers deserve that across the country and that's what they're fighting for. They're saying that when people are feeling squeezed, it shouldn't be that workers always have to sacrifice. We see that wealthy CEOs are making more money than ever before and workers are being asked to sacrifice. Enough is enough. No. Workers deserve wages that keep up with the cost of living. Workers deserve wages that meet and exceed inflation so workers can earn a good living and build a good life. And the final thing I want to say on that, on, on, the, on the brothers and sisters fighting, uh, we know that what, what liberals often do is they talk a good game, they say they're for the, for the workers, they say they're on the side of, of working people, and they say they're on the side of collective bargaining, and then when it comes down to it, they end up doing exactly what conservatives do and bring in back-to-work legislation. So I said in numerous questions to the Prime Minister, again and again, I said, first of all, if you're going to, first of all, you shouldn't do it right off the bat, it's not, it should take it off the table. I want you to commit that you're not going to bring back to work legislation. Uh, and secondly, if you have dared to do so, we absolutely 100% are not going to support it. We're going to fight it every step of the way. So friends, I want to wrap up by saying uh, I believe we are in a really challenging time. Um, we know that a lot of workers are feeling disillusioned. Sometimes people feel like, what's the point of voting? What's the point of getting out there? We got the red team and the blue team and they keep on flip-flopping and they're not really standing up for workers. And they talk a good game when they're running for office and then when they're in power, they do the same thing. They attack workers. They cut the benefits of workers. They cut the things that we need. And so I, I say to you all, we need to give people hope. We need to acknowledge the frustration and anger. That's, that's real. Workers are upset and they have the right to be. 
They have the right to be upset when they see that they're struggling and suffering, when Doug Ford's wealthy friends get hooked up, when the liberals hook up their, their well-connected insiders, when conservatives and liberals help those at the very top and ask workers to sacrifice. That is wrong, and people are frustrated and angry about that. So we have to sit with that anger, but then we also have to give people hope because things can be better. We can dream bigger. We can change things. If we have new Democrats in power, we're going to make sure that our governments are working for people for once, that we lift up people, <laughs> that we build a healthcare system that is truly universal and public and there for you from head to toe, that we can build an economy that works for working people, not for billionaires. We can build an economy that protects our environment and creates good jobs. We can invest in our kids. We can build that brighter future. We can do it together, and people are counting on us to do it together. So friends, let's lift each other up. Let's support one another. Let's fight back. Let's organize. Let's fight, and let's win. And let's build a future where we all rise together. Thank you, friends. Appreciate you all. Thank you.